SeaWorld of Florida culminated an unprecedented rescue and rehabilitation effort when it successfully released a seldom seen and rarely studied brides whale into the Gulf of Mexico. President George Bush visited the Marine Life Park to deliver a point of light award, his way of honoring those who address America's problems through community service. SeaWorld has been rehabilitating sea turtles for over 30 years. Today we're out here at Cape Canaveral National Seashore to release our 1,000th sea turtle. We had a mass stranding of pilot whales on Saturday, September 1st. They were under intensive care, very critical care, and it was really temporary care. Covering over 70% of the Earth's surface and containing 99% of the living space on the planet, it has been said that our oceans are man's only remaining frontier on Earth. Yet mankind's actions pollute and continue to destroy this habitat where nearly 50% of life call home. It is not uncommon to find these animals washed up on shore, their stomachs filled with trash that was mistaken for food, their homes devastated by shipping lanes and oil spills, or simply found entangled in ropes and fishing line. For this reason alone, it is important for organizations like SeaWorld to exist. They are the rescuers, the first responders, when these animals are in need of help. On March 21, 2014, SeaWorld celebrated their 50th anniversary. That's 18,262 days since their doors first opened. And in those 50 years, SeaWorld has rescued over 24,000 animals. That's about 1.31 animals rescued every day since SeaWorld's doors first opened in San Diego to the public. That's 24,000 animals given a second chance because of SeaWorld. And in those 50 years, SeaWorld has made it their mission to inspire and educate over 400 million guests to celebrate, connect with, and care for the natural world we share. This is their story. I think inspiration is key to everything that we do. You know, almost 50 years ago when San Diego opened, you know, I looked back at one of the original you know, documents that talked about the business plan. And it, in, in that document, it talked about education and conservation. Staying true to our mission is one of the things that really has kept us going for 50 years. And we're committed to staying true to that mission of celebrating, connecting, and caring. I have a saying, it's called, touch the heart to teach the mind. We've lived by it at our zoo. Unless you touch the heart of somebody to teach them something, then why would they want to take care of a killer whale, a lion, or a gerbil? Touching the heart to teach the mind is exactly what SeaWorld does every single day with their animals. And it's those moments that impact guests and employees alike. We had the opportunity to bring a, a mom and her little girl back to, uh, to have a moment with the killer whales. It was the child's wish. She was from Give Kids the World, and that was what she wanted. Something really amazing happened, and Kalina started interacting with the child just one-on-one. -on -one. It was just... Um, one of those times when you see these magnificent animals impact the life and knowing what that family was going to go through and knowing that we made a, a memory for this mom that she would be able to hold on to long after her child was gone, it was powerful, it really was. A lot of people don't know this, but I started my career at the Central Florida Zoo in Sanford in 1973. And if I'm not mistaken, SeaWorld opened just about when we came here. But all I know is I was some of the first guests with my little girls in that year. Some of the first guests at SeaWorld. And I'm from Tennessee, right? Do you think I'd ever seen a killer whale? I ain't even seen bass and carp. But I went there and saw that killer whale. And you can ask my wife, even to this day, uh, we had tears in our eyes when we saw that whale. We've had over 400 million guests come through our gates in the last 50 years. And it is my deep, abiding belief 
that we have significantly and positively impacted the world around us. Inspiration is a powerful connection between one's heart and mind. It's uniquely different to each person and comes without notice. But when it does, inspiration is something you feel throughout your entire being. And it's that inspiration that leaves an eternal imprint on everyone it affects. Every year our animals get their routine physicals just like we do. And I thought for sure that my new relationship with this bird was going to go down because I was, I was responsible for bringing him to the doctor. I was ready with a whole handful of fruit and I had his favorite. I had peaches and grapes and had him on my arm and I quickly handed him that whole handful of fruit. He took out a big chunk of his favorite fruit and tried feeding it to me. And so I had tears in my eyes that I was thinking, this bird's gonna hate me. And, and he just wanted to feed me. And that's when I knew that it's not just a bird and I'm not just a trainer, but we had a very special relationship. I wouldn't work for SeaWorld for over 30 years if I didn't believe in the message that we were giving to all of our guests that come here and anybody that would, would see any of our shows through any of our animal rescues that we are here for the animals. And you see, I do get emotional about it because that's where my heart is and I know that's where SeaWorld's heart is. We have guests that come into our parks every day thinking, oh, just, you know, shows, the fun, which is, is great. And then they start caring more about the animals. You see them up close. You start learning about what it is that they're facing, what's happening out there. And there's a lot of people that leave, and now they want to do something about it. And if we weren't here, maybe they wouldn't have that, that interest. You know, it wouldn't have sparked that, that caring in them. So what if SeaWorld wasn't here? I think we would have lost a lot. Well, SeaWorld has a very robust uh, animal rescue program. And the intent is you rescue an animal, you rehabilitate the animal, and you release the animal. Those are the three R's we look at when, when an animal is rescued. Yeah, a lot of people, they think that the, the rescue team, that what we do is that we walk in, jump in the truck, and we're driving up and down the, the coastline seeing what's going on. Um, no, we actually have our regular duties here at SeaWorld, uh, taking care of our, our animals that we have here at the different exhibits. You know, the one thing a lot of people don't realize is there's a stranding network. So SeaWorld's one branch of a lot of people working together to do the best they can for a single animal or hundreds of animals. Anytime there's a rescue situation, SeaWorld has to wait for the appropriate government agency to give us a phone call before we can, in fact, intervene and rescue that animal. This morning, approximately 22 pilot whales stranded at Avalon State Park in Fort Pierce, Florida. We got called that 22 pilot whales had stranded on the beach in Fort Pierce. There's a mass stranding not too far from here at SeaWorld. And when those pilot whales are beached, who do they call? SeaWorld. Because we understand, because we're equipped, and because we show up. At that point, SeaWorld calls their teams together. We get everybody ready and we head out. The scene on the beach that day was absolutely devastating. And every member of the Stranding Network knew time was running out. When we got there, National Marine Fisheries was on site, Hub Sea World Research in uh, Institute was on site, along with veterinarians that were both private from different organizations, University of Florida. Uh, of course, we took ours from SeaWorld there. It has been brought to the public's attention that a better fate for these stranded animals would be to let nature take its proverbial course or to use heavy machinery to aid in pushing these large animals back out to sea. We have seen through experience that when we push pilot whales or stranded animals back out into the ocean, oftentimes they immediately restrand and their suffering is prolonged. They stranded for a reason. We don't know why. And a lot of times, I won't say every single time, but most of the times you push them back in the water and what they'll do is go a few miles up or down the coast and do it again. But each rescue presents its own unique set of circumstances. 
Uh, to complicate it, we couldn't take any uh, vehicles on the beach because we were in a sea turtle nesting area. Because of the, the sea turtle nest, which is also protected, it gave us the, the, that little bit of an issue of, okay, we have to get them on the beach, but we can't bring equipment on the beach. Throw on top of that again, that these are older animals, and it's typically the ones that have the best chance of survival are the younger animals. It, it, it's really a very difficult situation because you would really love to save all of them. You'd like to at least make a go of it, trying. But unfortunately, the reality is that there are limitations in what you can do. And it was deemed that unfortunately, a lot of those animals had to be put down. We get a lot of animals that we can't save. And we remember all of them um, and we carry them with us but having to explain that to other people on the beach that have been taking care of that animal, man, that's hard, hard. Unfortunately, not all of the animals were able to be saved. However, five young animals were transported to Harbor Branch earlier today. The five smaller animals were taken to Harbor Branch to be housed for a couple of days. It happened to be the younger animals because what happens with these massive pilot whales is their body weight from being on the beach for so long eventually begins to crush their internal organs. The first 24 hours are the most crucial in any rescue situation. But despite the tireless efforts of the rescuers, one of the five pilot whales that were saved did not survive the first night. The hardest part of my job working with animals every single day is when you lose one. With the pilot whales, unfortunately, we, we lost one of the pilot whales. It's never easy, but as a rescuer, what we have to remember from that loss is that there are still the other remaining pilot whales who stranded that need our help, and we need to be there for them. Because it was uncertain why these animals strand themselves, it was important for SeaWorld to quarantine the rescued pilot whales during their rehabilitation in order to protect the health of the other animals at the park. Who makes the decision where the animals go once they're rescued? When it comes to pilot whales or cetaceans, it's National Marine Fisheries Services. They're the ones that make the final call. Here at SeaWorld in the meantime, our crews, and I take my hat off to these guys, our maintenance crews, uh, plant engineering guys, the carpenters, we put up a quarantine area because the only place big enough to be able to quarantine these guys was in our manatee rehabilitation area, which we moved all the manatees to our secondary uh, pools that we have, some other manatee holding areas for rehabilitation, convert these pools over, swap, take out all the fresh water, go to salt water. Uh, our water quality department was just going around the clock getting that done. In a matter of I'd say almost less than 48 hours, we had converted this area back here into a quarantine facility. Secondary entrance, we just converted this whole thing into something that was like a, 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 a mash hospital, basically. When we bring an animal in for, for from a rescue and we're in the, in the process of rehabbing this animal, Noah will go ahead and put a panel together to look at the case study of this animal. So all the health records, all the behavioral records, anything that is accumulated over the animal's rehabilitation process, NOAA is the owners of all these records. NOAA, or the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, is the scientific agency within the United States Department of Commerce whose mission is to conserve and manage coastal and marine ecosystems and resources. We are basically caring for the animal, we're the stewards of the animal, but NOAA has the oversight of this animal. For these pilot whales, they were kept in this quarantine situation, but we as caregivers were also kept in the quarantine situation. So our shifts were 13 hours long. Once we arrived in quarantine, we stayed there all day long. And we were getting in the water every four hours to tube feed them because they were not eating on their own yet. So we were assisting them with the tube feeding. And also we had another shift coming in to break us from the daytime at nighttime and they would stay overnight with the pilot whales. The hard work of getting these guys stabilized then getting them uh, from the gruel because they weren't eating at first, getting them onto solid food. Then we were able to bring the water up because they were stable, they were swimming well. It was extremely hard work. I would go home beat. By the end of the week, I think my one day off, I spent it sleeping and the next thing I knew it was time to go into work again. 
but it was the best, best experience I've ever had here. You know, we bring these animals in and we rehab them. We work with them day in and day out, 24 hours a day until they're good. They're either healthy and they're decided that they're gonna be returned or they're healthy and they're decided they need care of man for the rest of their life. Who makes that decision? Again, that's not SeaWorld. That's not the rescuer. These are separated and they're separated for a reason. Our job is to care for them, rehabilitate them, and once the decision's made, return them or go to the next step. In this case with these pilot whales, it was deemed by National Marine Fisheries Services that these animals were non-releasable. Because of their young age, it was unlikely that they had the benefit of a mother to teach them survival skills or a pod to rely on to learn how to hunt. And all of those factors went into the National Marine Fisheries Service decision that they would not be returned to the ocean. The National Marine Fishery Services is the division of NOAA that is responsible for the nation's ocean resources and their habitat. What happens at that point when the animal is deemed non-releasable? NOAA will go ahead and contact, will put a notice out to facilities that this animal is being deemed non-releasable. National Marine Fishery Services and an outside consortium is going to make that decision. Who and what facility is able and willing to care for these animals for the rest of their life? Because SeaWorld has experience with pilot whales and we are a leader among zoological facilities, the National Marine Fisheries Service determined that the pilot whale's lifelong care would be in our hands here at SeaWorld Orlando. And the great thing about this is that they're out at Whale and Dolphin Stadium where people can come up, uh, the trainers over there are doing presentations with these animals, so they're learning about some of the things that, that the animals are facing out there. They're, you know, why are they stranding or what, you know, what does it take to be able to, to help get them healthy again, if possible, get them back out to the natural environment. Although the pilot whales were deemed non-releasable by the federal government, there are countless stories where animals were released back to their natural habitats. It is important to note that SeaWorld's rescue team doesn't focus solely on marine life but terrestrial animals as well. Here at SeaWorld, we also have a rescue and rehab program for birds, uh, rescuing over 300 to 400 birds every year. We pay for it. We don't um, get any funding for that from the government or anybody. Um, SeaWorld totally pays for the cost of all of that. And back in 2000, uh, a jaguar went in and disrupted the natural breeding colony of Caribbean flamingos in the Yucatan of Mexico. And at that time, there were thousands of eggs that were abandoned. Um, some of them were hatching, there were actually some small chicks that were on the mounds. When the call came in and we were able to, and I was able to go out to Mexico to help raise these flamingo chicks, you know, we had phone conversations with the people that were in the field there. So you, you think you know what you're, you're going into, but it's, it's very overwhelming because, you know, we're, we're fortunate. We have a, a hardware store close by, anywhere you, you, you can go to get your supplies, and that's not the case in Rio Lagartos. The closest place to get anything was about three hours away, so we really had to rely on the village people there to get any sort of netting or something to make a fence with, because as the chicks grow, um, you need larger habitat for them. So you know, they start off in little boxes, and then we wound up turning uh, the conference table, turning that upside down, putting chicken wire around it, and newspaper. Kind of really have to think outside the box and utilize whatever you have. And it's just amazing how everyone comes together for that and, and we just managed to put it all together. Each and every day was a new day um, of just throwing something together for the Flamingo Chicks but that's what we were there for and it was a huge success. I happened to be involved with the largest release of any animal in the world ever. That was JJ the whale out in California. We were just filming out there. Not, I think we were in San Diego somewhere filming. We weren't even at SeaWorld and we got this news all over the thing. They just rescued, I think it was a, I don't know if it was a blue whale or what type of whale it was. But this thing was like a baby, but it was still big, you know? And it was there, they were just bottle feeding it. It was the second day it was there. We filmed that whole thing. And then at that point, a year or two later, I think maybe a year, year and a half, the thing grew so fast. It was almost like a, a giant. It's like nothing I've ever seen. And they had to put the animal back out in the ocean, you know? They didn't, they knew what the right thing for that animal was. I mean, SeaWorld could have easily kept that animal and you'd had people coming from all over the world to see the largest, basically, mammal in the world in a, in a situation like that. But they said, no, we got to put it back out in the wild. And the millions of dollars, not thousands, millions of dollars that was spent on J.J. the whale, that day, they got up at 2 in the morning, started to load up in the trailer. They went there down the interstate and put on the Coast Guard cutter that went like this, and never forget as long as I live. 
go out there, out in the ocean, and I'll tell you, there wasn't a dry eye in that place when all of a sudden you say goodbye to JJ and whew, in the water. That was one of the most phenomenal releases I've ever seen. I've seen them release manatee, sea turtles, sea lions, seals, birds. And to see the release of an animal like that in the wild is, is absolutely mind-boggling. We had a dolphin that came in last year off the east coast of Florida. He looked to be a little underweight. We brought that particular animal in, and he was underweight. Uh, blood parameter-wise, he looked to be fairly healthy, but weight-wise, he was a fairly thin animal. So the main task at this was to put weight on this particular animal. We were looking at about 400 and 450 pounds, and we got that animal to that weight in about six months. At that point, NOAA considered this to be a releasable animal, a healthy animal that would contribute still to the natural uh, stock of animals. You know, the environment that this animal needs to go back to, it has to be a healthy environment. We don't wanna, we don't wanna rehab an animal get it all nice and healthy and put it in an environment that's not really that healthy. In a particular example that I used here with this, this particular male dolphin that came in last year, down along the east coast of the United States, we have what we call an unusual mortality event. A UME has been declared for cetaceans and a dolphin is a cetacean. In 2013, the Indian River Lagoon event was declared an unusual mortality event and by unusual mortality event it just means that we had significantly larger numbers of dolphins that were stranding in a kind of confined geographical area and that these animals were actually exhibiting similar pathologies as well and in this case it happened that the majority of them were very emaciated. So this particular animal we were we were all ready to release we wanted to make sure we didn't put him back into an environment that the UME was active. So we found an area that we felt, everyone felt comfortable that we, if we were to re-release him, he would be in a healthy environment. Our sister park in San Diego last year, they had, I don't know how many sea lions that they rescued because they had a, a mortality event and they rescued an ungodly amount of sea lions where we had to send people from our other SeaWorld parks here, Florida and San Antonio out to San Diego to help them because the workload was just so much and it was round the clock also. Really the goal of our rescue and rehabilitation program is get them healthy again and return them back out to their natural environment. You know, manatees, we keep males and females separate here. We don't want them breeding here. We want them back out there having their babies out there because, you know, they'll, the babies will stick with mom and they have to learn migration routes. Where's the warm water? Where's the food? They're not going to learn that here, they learn that out there. So we want to get them as healthy as possible, as quick as possible, and get them right back out there. If maybe about 18 to 20 years ago, I was at SeaWorld in, in uh, Orlando, and they had the rehabbing of the manatee there, and they were packed full. Manatees were everywhere. Why is that? They just go out and pick them up in the wild and say, I'm more a manatee. No. But these manatees can get wiped out in less than two seasons if we're not careful. And SeaWorld, the history will prove that this, these parks will be responsible for saving the manatee from extinction. I really believe that. You know, in 1990, the early 90s, we rescued a baby manatee out of Brunswick, Georgia. Her name is Georgia, after where she was rescued. We hand-raised her, we rehabilitated her, we returned her back to the wild, and this past January, she's back in because she's lost some weight. She came to Blue Springs State Park. Her name's Georgia, and here's a neat story about Georgia. Georgia has six of her own calves that she's had out since she's been returned. She's got three grand calves out there. Now, people ask, should SeaWorld do what they're doing? Should SeaWorld be here? Well, I can tell you right now that in a population of just 5,000, 5,500 animals, SeaWorld and one animal put back nine animals from their one little job. So if SeaWorld shouldn't be here, you won't have Georgia. You won't have Georgia's children and you won't have George's grandchildren. I would say SeaWorld should be here. I believe what we do. I believe in it very strongly. And George is just one of many stories that shows what one small organization can do to one massive world. Some people in this business may not like this quote, I'll give it to you. Most every zoo and park in this country should have been shut down in the 1950s and 60s, even probably in the early 70s. It wasn't what you what you'd call the proper habitat for that animal, the proper care, the proper veterinary medicine. Look what's happening today, my gosh. I mean, look what we're learning, look what we're learning what to do. I mean, it's amazing, isn't it?
we're educated, what's that word? Educated again over time, how to take care of animals, how to breed animals, when to put an animal back out in the wild, when not to. And the evolution of animal care is just really amazing since I've been here. And I've been working with SeaWorld for close to uh, 30 years. And I know it's evolved tremendously even prior to uh, me coming and working with the company. We have close to 500 individuals on our zoological team. And those are the folks I get to interact with daily, that, that we all work together managing the animals, managing the education programs, managing the life support systems. They are the experts. They know how to do their job. They are just the quintessential uh, professionals. It's the knowledge and compassion of SeaWorld's professionals that have made their parks the world-renowned facilities they are today. AZA, or the Association of Zoos and Aquariums, is an accrediting body here, um, primarily in the United States, and SeaWorld is a member of that AZA accreditation process. And what that means is we meet very, very high standards in managing animals and conservation and education programs at our facility. Although this AZA accreditation is not required to operate as a zoological facility, SeaWorld believes that it is necessary to hold themselves to the highest standards when it comes to animal care. It is a rigorous process. You have inspectors come out to your facility every five years and they spend uh, a good week with you and going through everything in your application and stuff that's not in your application. And we meet or exceed all those standards. If you look at how we, we work with the animals here, it's a holistic approach. It didn't always used to be like that. Um, we are not only working with the animals physically, but also the mental state of the animals is, is taken into account every day. If you wanted to develop a relationship with a person, or with an animal. The best, most effective, quickest way to do that is teach them something. It creates an automatic connection. We develop very deep, trusting relationships with these animals. It's so important for the animals to trust us, and building that relationship with the animals is one of the coolest parts of my job, and a lot of times it's teaching them something new, or with the otters, bringing them to a new place and showing them that everything is going to be okay and that our relationship, I will never put you in a situation that wouldn't be okay. And their cooperation with us as trainers is what allows us to do so many amazing things. I think what's really important for people to understand is what they see in the shows is a very small portion of what we actually teach them. Um, we teach them a lot of things so that we can provide care for them. Basically, everything that you do when you go to the doctor, we can do. We can do sonograms, we can do EKGs, we can do x-rays, we can do blood samples and urine, urine samples and measurements. We can do all of these things to care for the animals and contribute to our knowledge base about them. Let's use uh, animal care with a, a killer whale, for example. A killer whale gets a full health assessment every month. So uh, that's probably a better health care plan than most people. And what that entails is if you're looking at uh, the, the weight of the killer whale, you're looking at the blood parameters of the killer whale, you're, uh, you're doing a full body exam of the killer whale. And that really occurs daily, but a formal one occurs once every month. Now the advancements throughout the years that have taken place, if you look at the human medical field, and you look at the advancement, advancements that have taken place over the last decades, at least since I've been around. And this is astounding what has occurred here. The, the equipment that has come up, the testing, the ways of monitoring and tracking health. Those particular ways of monitoring human health have actually been paralleled in the animal field. So a lot of the techniques, of a lot of the equipment, a lot of the philosophies have been uh, used now with animals. For instance, uh, when, a, when an animal's pregnant, a dolphin, a killer whale, a sea lion, an otter, a bird, anything like that. When an animal's pregnant, we can track when the animal is impregnated all the way through the pregnancy until the birth of that particular animal. And then after the animal is born, we know what a normal a neonate or a normal calf would look like and what those parameters are. Decades ago, it may not have occurred. So those are really some of the advancements that have occurred in the field of animal care. In our field, the animal world is our lives, obviously, obviously our family as well. But these animals, to some people might not have kids that work in the zoo, this is their family. This is, this is like, you know, you wouldn't believe how these animals are cared for. Uh, it, it, as I travel the world, I, I just wish some people I see throughout the world could be treated this way.
SeaWorld rescues animals, we talk about that. SeaWorld cares for animals, we talk about that. SeaWorld puts on amazing shows with animals, which is really neat. There's something else SeaWorld does, and that's we educate people. We actually spend time educating. Now, the zoological department is made up of many different departments. Education, conservation is part of the zoological team. That component of the zoological team is the largest component we have. We have over 200 individuals that are part of the education conservation department. These teams are throughout the park during the day. They conduct our education comp, uh, camps programs. They do tours. Uh, generally, as people come through the front gate, they may not know they're interacting with an education or conservation person, but it happens. This is the core of our being. And being able to take our guests and connect them with the whales and let them experience that, even if it's vicariously just for a moment, brings, to, brings them to the place where they have this life-changing experience. And our hope is that when they leave and they've had that experience, that it will impact their behavior, that they'll make better choices for our environment, that they'll make better choices for the animals, and they'll, they'll make a difference for this natural world that we're all looking at and saying, gosh, Look what we've done to the environment. Oh my gosh, look what we've done to the habitats that these animals come from. And they can make a difference. One of the coolest things that I've heard is that they haven't had a chance to see a lot of the animals that we have here up close and in person. For example, our pilot whales. We have four rescued pilot whales here at SeaWorld Orlando. And just that experience of guests seeing these pilot whales who now have a second chance at life have inspired them to make more earth-friendly, more ocean-friendly choices. It is SeaWorld's belief that through the power of entertainment, they can inspire and educate people to celebrate, connect with, and care for the natural world we share. No one can tell me that those people don't appreciate whether the whales, the dolphins, whatever it might be, more than they ever did before even going there and seeing what the animal is like. Again, touch the heart to teach the mind. It's that simple, it's not rocket science. It's one thing to be able to see an animal uh, when you're watching TV and you see, you know, oh, th this happened or that happened, or you see a documentary, you know, about a certain species, versus being right in front of it. You're looking at the animal, you're seeing it. It's kind of an overpowering feeling, I think, when you actually get to see something like that up close. It's incredible to be a part of watching a guest make a connection with an animal. That one-on-one -on -one connection that they can only get through visiting a place like SeaWorld and watching the light bulb go off and then being inspired to care. It's the same thing that I had when I was four years old and I had my first visit here. The reason why the killer whale is so important to SeaWorld um, and the fact that the reason why it's so important that it inspires people is the killer whale is an apex predator. And you look at all the animals down the food chain that, that the killer whale relies on. And the thing is, is, is if you're inspired by the killer whale, which I was as a child, um, then I, I learned that, you know what? Salmon is an important part of some killer whale's diet. So you know what? I'm gonna wanna protect the salmon. Um, you know what's also part of the salmon's diet? Are some smaller, like minnows and other smaller fish. You know what? They need to be protected because the salmon need to eat them and killer whales need to eat the salmon. It's part of the circle of life. And if we allow any of that system to break down, then you know what? Killer whales are gonna go away. And that's something I learned at SeaWorld, that it's not just the fact that I love Shamu, because I do, but it's the fact that I want Shamu's family and relatives in the ocean to thrive, and that can only thrive if I'm actively out there protecting the whole system that allows killer whales to thrive. Not only does SeaWorld inspire guests of the parks, they also take their animal ambassadors on the road to educate people throughout the country. One of the coolest parts of my job is getting to train our animal ambassador otters. And I've had the privilege of working with them since they were born here at SeaWorld. So we are able to pick them up and travel all over the United States with them, take them to television sets, educate children on how important these marine mammals are. Otters represent a threatened species of animal. At one point, otters were hunted to virtually extinction because of their pelts. So to have the ability to bring out a marine mammal and expose them to children and adults and show them this animal that was once endangered and now is making a recovery, they represent what we can do through caring more for our environment. You walk through this park and there are hundreds and hundreds of education points. There's educators talking. 
I'll go out and talk to people and explain why you should throw your trash away. Don't dump it in our water because I'm going to have to end up rescuing that animal to get that fishing line off that would have taken you 30 seconds to pull in. You know, but on top of that, we go do returns or releases, and you should see how many kids show up. And we can stop for five minutes and talk to all those kids who will talk to their friends about how neat it was they got to see this animal get returned and SeaWorld was there. And this big tall guy told us the story of how this animal could have been saved and how it was cared for and what they can do in the future. The education, the care doesn't stop when we leave the gates. It just doesn't stop because I'm off the clock and I'm going home. It's what SeaWorld does. We go clean beaches. People here at SeaWorld, employees volunteer their time on their weekends to go clean up a beach. When they're out at the beach cleanup or they're out at Turbo it's not like they're, they're waving a flag saying SeaWorld taught me this. You know, it's the fact that that is the result of being inspired. You know, the, the subtle message that, that SeaWorld kind of fills your heart and your passion with. The moment you hear that there's an opportunity to go and clean up a beach or, or help with a whale strand, you're there because you love those animals. And, and all you think about is how can I help and protect those animals in the wild. Every guest that comes here plays a huge role. In all the exhibits that they go to, we have that conservation message. It's important to us that our kind, humankind, is what's going to save the species on this planet. I mean, species are going extinct, I don't want to say almost daily, but quite more frequently. Um, penguins in general, there's 18 species of penguins, and half of them are threatened or endangered. They are protected, but through our message, people coming to Antarctica, talking to the education team, talking to the aviculture team, they're learning about, about the plight of the penguins and seeing what measures they could possibly take to protect them in their natural world. I think conservation with animals and habitats really starts with education. Um, if you don't know about the animals, there's um, not much desire to protect them and to save them. But so once we educate people about the animals and the habitats that are around them, we're able to instill that passion and excitement. And there's so many animals and habitats around that really depend on us to either save them or protect them uh, because it's really up to people whether we want to see these animals and habitats thrive or decline. When I hear people dismiss SeaWorld or when I hear people say bad things about SeaWorld, you know, especially people who, who consider themselves conservationists or people who consider themselves animal lovers, it's probably one of the most frustrating things to me, it, it personally, because I see SeaWorld as one of the very few organizations that is around the world, on every continent, doing something to improve habitats, education, and, 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 and actively involved in species conservation. And so why you would attack SeaWorld when they're so actively involved in that is mind-boggling to me when there's some real threats, some real dangers that really need our effort and our funding to take care of. The SeaWorld and Bush Gardens Conservation Fund, which was established in 2003, has partners in conservation all around the world. And we donate about a million dollars annually to these projects. And all the money that's donated to the conservation fund directly goes to on-the-ground efforts. Now the neat part is this isn't all just SeaWorld. Everybody that comes in this park and buys something is putting towards conservation fund. If you go to the Turtle Trek, I mean they've got Everyday Hero it's called, and you can see how much money is going to the conservation fund. And then these organizations who really need the financing, they need the money to continue their great work. SeaWorld's able to say, yeah, we can help you out. On behalf of the SeaWorld and Bush Gardens Conservation Fund, I was sent down to Panama for two weeks to work with our conservation partners. The Pan American Conservation Association is the only dedicated rescue and rehabilitation organization in the entire country of Panama. The APPC is a Panamanian organization that uh, have a mission for conservation and our main projects are related to wildlife rescue in the Panama area. So when we created the APPC back in 2004, our first uh, grant came from the U.S. Forest Service. After that, the, they actually referred us to the SeaWorld Bush Garden Conservation Fund. The first few projects were directly related to the wildlife rescue program. Now, one of our main projects where we also use uh, the SeaWorld Bush Garden Conservation Fund was to participate in the Panama Canal construction. Throughout that uh, rescue, we relocate more than 2,000 animals in several national parks in Panama. 
uh, and we rescue a, a big variety of species that will represent basically like more than 50% of the species of animals we have in Panama. In Panama, there's not, not really a high priority placed on animals, and so the people that came to the park didn't really know a lot about them, and they didn't have a lot of respect for them because they didn't know about them. So it was our goal to educate them and build that respect and appreciation for Panamanian wildlife. Over the last 50 years, SeaWorld has spent millions of dollars doing scientific research on not only killer whales, but all the animals that we have in our care. If you go out on a boat or a vessel to watch a killer whale, and you'll see a killer whale surface to take a breath, exhale, inhale, and then dive. It's a very small percentage of the actual life of a killer whale. Well, in a park such as SeaWorld, a zoological facility, we can see these guys 100% of the time tracking these particular animals. We just did a study here with Hub SeaWorld Research Institute. Um, Hub SeaWorld Research Institute was founded in 1963, which was actually the year right before SeaWorld had um, opened their doors. We've had a long history of working on different species all the way back to 51 years ago. We work on birds, we work on polar bears, we work on marine mammals and we come at it from all different angles. So we have a veterinarian on staff and we do health assessment type research to find out how healthy the population is. We have ecologists who are looking at the ecosystem and how those animals fit into the ecosystem. We do aquaculture work where we're actually growing fish to be released back out into the ocean. Um, and then another core project that we have is acoustic work, so understanding how different species, not just marine mammals, but birds, for instance, communicate. We operate under a straining agreement, which is under NOAA Fisheries. So our program here at Hub Sea World Research Institute is part of the National Marine Mammal Straining Network. So we have special permits that allow us to not only research these animals, but also to go and collect samples and to do research. So this is not something that just anybody can do. We really have different levels of experience and expertise that allows us to, to study these animals. So everything that we do, um, there's oversight from NOAA Fisheries. So since the 1970s, Hub SeaWorld has been conducting um, ecological studies and health-based studies to assess the population that resides in the Indian River Lagoon, as well as the animals that reside on the ocean side. Most of our research pertains to stranded animals. So when we go out on the beach, um, we're not just going out to, to learn more about that individual animal or to, to see what we can do to help that animal. We're really looking at the whole population. We're carefully conducting a necropsy and, and collecting samples to learn more about why that animal stranded and ultimately why that animal died but also looking at the biology of that species and learning more about that population of animals and sort of what uh, threats they're facing in the wild. With the assistance of Hub SeaWorld Research Institute, SeaWorld has conducted studies to help with the understanding of killer whales in the wild, specifically in regard to their caloric intake. And it was really studying the caloric need of a killer whale at rest. What is that? No one knew. We do know now, and that really helps out because you've got an endangered group of killer whales in the southern resident pod. We believe one of the factors uh, that, that, that is seeing the decline of these particular animals is their food source, salmon. So what is the caloric intake, knowing why they feed, how much they need to feed, this really helps us with now um, managing that particular group of killer whales, knowing how much food they need to eat. Now the food source is believed to be one of the issues with those particular animals. They, they've also believed that there's a lot of pollutants in the water up there. The third triad of all this is they're thinking boat traffic is really, they've seen the behavior modification. You'll hear some of uh, the, the folks out there say that killer whales swim hundreds of miles a day. A killer whale does not wake up in the morning and go, I'm gonna go out and get my exercise. I've gotta swim 100 miles because it's part of being physically fit. They don't do that. If you look at animals in our natural environment, Animals use their energy very conservatively. They only use it when they need to. Killer whales swim 100 miles a day because they need to. They need the food, they need to reproduce, or maybe they have to deviate because of the shipping lanes. But that's the reason these animals swim for, for long distances. So Hub Sea World Research Institute has a long history of, of trying to find um, solutions to conflicts 
between animals and humans. And, and so in the lagoon, there, there was a conflict where dolphins were actually getting into Fisher's crab pots. In some cases, the dolphins were getting entangled. Our most famous case is a, a dolphin known as Winter. She was rescued in 2005 from the Canaveral National Seashore. We were the lead responding agency, um, first responders to her rescue. Um, when we got out on the water, she was struggling at the surface, um, wrapped up in this, in this rope. Um, but she had really bad damage to her tail, to the sides of her mouth, around her body. So she really was struggling to breathe and she was completely exhausted. Um, so we were able to follow her into shallow water and, and to get our hands on her. Fortunately, um, we had an animal care staff and, and a team from SeaWorld come out to the scene. Um, they transported her with help from Harbor Branch Oceanographic over to Clearwater Marine Aquarium. Um, so a couple days after she started rehab, they started to notice how uh, deeply affected her tail was from this entanglement. So basically, it was like a tourniquet. And because that tissue had no blood flow, it just started to die. So it wasn't an amputation, it wasn't a surgery, it was just a gradual process of cleaning her wounds um, and just kind of the sloughing away as that tissue died that led her to completely lose her tail. And, and that's how she became famous. So her story started with a, a very simple crab pot interaction. We have done some work to try and figure out ways where we could mitigate in other words, make it tougher for the dolphins to get into crab pots. We had tested different types of bungee designs or door closures, which would keep dolphins out. And so we found ways in which significantly decreased um, dolphin interactions with their pots. It is important for organizations like Hub SeaWorld Research Institute to have access to trained animals in a park environment to help protect animals in the wild. Hub SeaWorld Research Institute, along with the federal government, asked that we, we look at um, why are dolphins still being caught in the nets? We did a, a lot of research on that, and we did really, what are the animals seeing sonar-wise at the nets here at, at, in our SeaWorld Park in San Diego? And what we learned were, is when an animal, when a dolphin was looking at a net, the net became almost invisible to the sonar at 90 degrees. They also developed some techniques to put pingers on nets. So, the animals here at SeaWorld allowed us to trial and error a lot of these things that you just couldn't do in the natural environment. And it helps save some dolphins in the process. Because of SeaWorld's dolphin collection, because of their ability to allow researchers in, they were able to design these dolphin safe tuna nets that today save the lives of millions of dolphins around the world. Again, things you don't learn, you know, because SeaWorld is so content with just doing what they do, which is save the ocean, inspiring people. Our mission is critical to us. It's been the cornerstone of everything we've done for 50 years. And it's really simple. It's using the power of entertainment to inspire our guests to celebrate, connect, and care for the natural world. You know, we're all here for the same purpose. You know, everyone understands the mission. And you know, whether you're working in a, in a kitchen flipping burgers or you know, on the rescue team, you know, the team members here love what they do. You really have to be dedicated to this. Uh, if it's a holiday, a lot of people think, you know, Christmas, New Year's, Thanksgiving. If we have a case that we're working on, we have to be here taking care of that. Yeah, it can be during a holiday. It can be in the middle of the night. When there's a call, our team is out there at a moment's notice. It's not uncommon sometimes to stay here 24 hours straight before you can get to go home. This isn't a job. This isn't the normal, I clock in, I clock out, and when I go home, I'm... You know, I'm a, this totally different person. This is who we are. This is, this is what I am. I'm not just this person that comes to SeaWorld and throws on a wetsuit and goes out and jumps around a little bit. You know, this is who I am to my core. I've done a lot of really neat rescues and I've had a lot of fun, but a couple of months ago, my son, who's now three, and it sort of changed some things, called and said, are you coming home? I said, no, I'm still at work, I'm working. And he said, are you saving the dolphin? It's the first time he's ever said dolphin. And then you put in there, you save it. And it, it sort of put really in perspective how he looks at what I do. There's a lot of times I'm not home and mommy's always saying he's working. Well, now he knows three things. SeaWorld, saving dolphins, and daddy. You put that together, that's what his dad does. He works for SeaWorld, he saves dolphins, and that's how a three-year-old looks at what I do. That's pretty cool. That, for me, is the touch that makes this job even neater that he can look at me that way. They are the rescuers, the educators, the ones who have inspired a generation of people and will continue to inspire generations to come.